AB Calculus, section 4.4, Optimization. Students will be able to analyze a problem, write a function to model the problem, and then use techniques of calculus to find maximum minimum values. This is an example of optimizing uh, the function and also justifying your solution. Let's look at an example back from 2015, number five on the non-calculator portion of the exam. The figure above, which is not above, but to the right, shows the graph of f prime, the derivative of the twice differentiable function f. Okay, whenever uh, a problem tells you that a function is twice differentiable, that just tells you that the second derivative exists of f. Okay, on this interval from negative three to four, the graph of f prime has horizontal tangents at negative one and positive one and three. That just tells us that f prime of negative one is equal to zero, f prime at positive 1 and f prime at 3 are all equal to 0. The area of the regions bounded by the x-axis and the graph of f prime on the interval are 9 and 12 respectively. We are not going to be utilizing that information yet, so everything within this we will not use yet. We haven't gotten to that part of the course yet. Okay, it says for part A, find all x-coordinates at which f has a relative maximum. Okay, so based on the graph, f of x has a relative max when two things happen. First, f prime of x is equal to zero or doesn't exist. In this case, we can tell that f prime exists on the interval from negative 3 to 4. And f prime changes sign, changes from negative to positive. Oops, I got that flipped from positive to negative. Okay, so a local max occurs. when f prime at x is equal to zero and changes from positive to negative. All right, so let's, let's take a look at the graph of f prime and identify the point or points. So f prime is positive, then zero, then negative. I know I'd have a local max at x equals negative two. I would not have a local max here. There would actually be no local extrema. And again, at the end point, we can't have a local max. So we would have uh, a relative max or a local max for f at x equals uh, negative two. And our justification for said thing is that f prime at negative two equals zero and f prime of x changes sign from positive to negative. Okay, part B. On what open intervals contained in that interval from negative three to four is the graph of F both concave down and decreasing? Okay, so <clears throat> concavity will have to do with F double prime. So if F of X is concave down, F double prime is less than zero. Okay, and decreasing has to do with the first derivative. I want to know where f prime of x is less than zero. So I want to know where both of those are true. So let's analyze the graph. Well, <clears throat> let's isolate first where f prime is less than zero. That would be everywhere on this interval. Okay, so everywhere from negative two to four, and actually not everywhere, but Part B, everywhere except for x equals 1, uh, f prime is less than 0 on the interval from negative 2 to 1 and from 1 to 3. Okay, in addition, uh, f double prime is less than 0 
on the following interval. Well, f double prime is equivalent to the slope of f prime. So f double prime is decreasing, or f prime is decreasing from negative 3 to negative 1. Okay, so if f prime is decreasing, then f double prime is less than 0. Negative 3, negative 1. f prime is also decreasing from 1 to 3, as well as from 1 to 3. Okay, now, where do these two sets overlap? Well, they overlap, it looks like, from negative 2 to negative 1. All right, so let's, let's isolate this. I knew that f double prime was negative here. f double prime was negative here. f prime was negative in this entire interval. Therefore, I can see that the overlap clearly occurs from negative 2 to negative 1. Thus, thus has an H in it. Thus, um, f of x is concave down and decreasing on that yellow interval, which is from negative 2 to negative 1 as well as from 1 to 3. And my justification I already have written in red and in green right above that. All right, let's look at part C. Okay, part C, what do you say to us? Find the x-coordinates of the points of inflection and give a reason for your answer. Okay, so I want to know where f double prime of x equals zero or doesn't exist. In this case, I won't have to worry about it not existing. Uh, and changes sign. So I'm kind of writing my reason first. Okay, so f double prime equals zero and changes sign at the following values. All right, so let's see. Remember, f double prime is the slope of f prime. And look at this, I've got all my values. Hey, now look at that. So here, f prime, excuse me, f double prime of negative one is equal to zero. Here, f double prime at positive one equals zero. Here, f double prime at three is equal to zero. And notice how the slope of f prime goes from negative to positive. So that means f double prime changes from negative to zero to positive from positive to zero to negative, from negative to zero to positive. Therefore, uh, it changes sign at x equals negative one, one, and three. Thus, f of x has point of inflection at each of those values. All right, outstanding. Let's look at another example. Okay, before we get to example two, theorem 4.5 is an important one. One local extremum implies absolute extremum. Okay, so if you only have one uh, local extreme value, that implies that it will have to be your absolute extreme value. Okay, so as you're looking for your critical values where f prime uh, is equal to zero. If you only get one value, and that value is a local extreme value, then it is also an absolute extreme value. Okay, so um, let's take a look at example two. It says find two non-negative numbers whose sum is 10 and whose product is maximized. Okay, so let's take two values, x and y, Add them to equal 10. Okay, so the product of x and y, well, let's see here, would be x times y, clearly, 
but let's put the product in terms of simply x. Okay, so if x plus y equals 10, then x equals 10 minus y. Okay, as well as y equals 10 minus x. Now, if I want to put my product in terms of x, I'm going to substitute in for y. I'm going to substitute 10 minus x in for y. So the product of these two numbers, they're positive numbers, and their sum is 10, would be 10x minus x squared. Okay. Now, we know that the product would be 0 if one of them was 0 and the other one was 10. Okay. Now, let's look at the derivative of the product. If I took the derivative, I would get 10 minus 2x. So if I want to know where the derivative of the product is equal to 0, let's analyze what that would look like. Clearly, x would equal 5. Okay, so let's maximize. Let's first look at the product function in terms of x. Okay, I know if x equals 0 and y equals 10, or if x equals 10 and y equals 0, my product would be 0. If you look at this function, p of x, it's a quadratic that opens downward. So any quadratic, if we've got their x-intercepts, their max value will actually be the midpoint of those two x values. Okay, so we would expect a max value for this product when x equals 5. Now, in what other way could I confirm this? Well, I know p prime of x equals 0 at x equals 5. So that tells me p prime at 5 equals 0. Well, I could also use the second derivative test and find p double prime of x. Well, p double prime of x would equal negative 2. I just took the derivative of p prime. Using the second derivative test, since p prime of 5 equals 0 and p double prime at 5 would equal negative 2, then by the second derivative test, p of x is maximized when x equals 5. Now, what would y equal if x equaled 5? We'll check it out over here. If x plus y equals 10 and x equals 5, then y would also equal 5. All right, there you have it. That's the use of the second derivative test, and this one local extremum implies absolute extremum. So as I look at that, I see that p prime equals 0 at only one value. That's going to then signify that I'll either have an absolute minimum at x equals 5 or an absolute maximum at x equals 5. That's why I went to the next step, found the second derivative, and determined using the second derivative test whether that would be an absolute min or max. All right, let's do another example. All right, here we go. Example number three, farmer best has 10 meters of wire fence with which he plans to build two identical adjacent pens as shown. What are the dimensions of the total enclosure for which its area is maximized? And what is the domain? Okay, as I look at this, okay, I'm going to label each of the sides appropriately based on their lengths. Okay, so it asks, what are the dimensions of the enclosure uh, for which the area is maximized? First, let's talk about area. Okay, uh, area, in this case, will be x times 2y, right? Base times height. All right, so let me kind of clean that up just a little bit. That'll be 2xy. So that's area in terms of both x and y. Now, we know that you have 10 meters of fencing. So we know that 10 meters, this is a really small pen. There must be 
like some small children inside this pen. I don't know. But 10 would equal 3x's plus 4y's. Okay, in order to create this enclosure, that's what it must be. All right, so let's write area in terms of x alone. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to solve this equation for y. So I would have 10 minus 3x over 4 would equal y. All right, so I'd have 2 times x times this new expression, 10 minus 3x over 4. Okay, now there are going to be certain uh, restrictions, right, or a domain on both x and y. Well, clearly, if I have 10 meters of fencing, I cannot have x be more than 10 thirds, right? Because then I would have nothing for y. I would have nothing left over for the width of this pen. So x must be greater than 0 and less than 10 thirds. Okay, so let's continue. The reason why this is important is because we might find critical values that fall outside of that domain. All right, so let's clean the area function with respect to x up slightly. Uh, we can reduce this. Uh, bring that 4 out in front, which would make this 1 half times the expression 10x minus 3x squared. Now I'm going to distribute the 1 half, making this 5x minus 3 halves x squared. So this would be the function in terms of x for the area. All right, so let's find, of course, when we want to minimize or maximize in this case, we always take the derivative of our function. That would be 5 minus 3x. OK, now let's look at and set our derivative function equal to 0. It looks like x would end up equaling 5 thirds. OK, now we have one critical value, right? That means we're going to have either a local max or a local min here. Since the problem is asking us for a maximum, uh, you can kind of assume that the max value for the area would happen at this uh, value for x. Okay. Now let me find the value for y such that this would be true. So if 10 equals 3 times x, I'm going to plug in a 5 thirds plus 4y. Okay, that means 10 is equal to 5 plus 4y. So that means 5 is equal to 4y. That means y is equal to 5 fourths. Okay, so I'm going to claim that when x equals 5 thirds, y equals 5 fourths, and that there's a maximum, right? That area... is maximized when that's true. x equals 5 thirds and y equals 5 fourths. Okay, so let's prove it. I know that a prime of 5 thirds equals 0. Let's find a double prime. A double prime of x would be negative 3. Therefore, a double prime of 5 thirds would also be negative 3. Therefore, by the second derivative test, I'm going to just shorten this, derivative test, then what would be true? The area would be maximized when x equals 5 thirds, which refers to y, which would be 5 fourths. Now, let's talk about Farmer Best for a minute and what kind of animals he's enclosing uh, with the dimensions of this enclosure. Okay, let's look at the dimensions. Let's go um, the length and width. Well, the length of the pen is x meters, so the length is equal to 
uh, one and two thirds meters. All right, and the width is equal to two Y. So the width of the pen is uh, five halves meters. I don't know what kind of animals uh, Farmer Best is, maybe it's little baby chickens, I don't know. But uh, for the dimensions, I mean, to have a, a pen that's five thirds by five halves. Eh, come on, Mr. Best, get it together. All right, let's look at another example as I try to write the word dimension. All right, guys, let's do one more example here. It says, consider a triangle on the XY plane. Two vertices of the triangle are on the X axis at one zero and five zero. Let's make a little sketch here. Ooh, that was really good. Thank you. Uh, at one zero, I've got a vertex. At five zero, I've got a vertex. And then I got this function. Okay, and I got uh, the third vertex on this function. Now, if I were to plug in uh, a one half into this function, all right, I'm gonna get some output. Let's see what it would be. Y of one half would equal natural log of one, which is zero. Minus one fourth plus five, so I get uh, four and three fourths. Four and three fourths. Okay, so just to give us a reference, four and three fourths. Okay, and I don't know exactly what this this function looks like. I guess I could plug in an eight, but that's going to get kind of goofy looking. Okay, let's. I'm just going to make a. It's just generally speaking. I don't know if that's what that function looks like, but let's just pretend. Okay. So my third vertex is somewhere on this line, whether it's here or here or here or here or on this endpoint, whatever. All right, so what I've got is, is at whatever endpoint that ends up, I've got each of these individual triangles that are formed. Okay. If you're planning on guessing which of these triangles has the largest area, don't do it. Please don't do it. Okay, let's create an area function. Well, the area, generally speaking, for a triangle is one half base times height. Fortunately for us, we know the base. The base is always four. So the area will be one half times four times the height. Now, the height is interesting to think about. The height will be, I should do a different color. How about yellow? The height will be whatever the y value is on the function. Okay, so in one case, it might be 4 and 3 fourths, but it's going to be our y value. In this case, the height will equal the function. So the area function will be 1 half times 4 times the function itself. I'm going to write this as minus x over 2 plus 5. This area function is good or is applicable only when x is between these two values. Okay, so a of x. I'm going to actually do a little work on cleaning this up. Well, 1 half of 4 is 2. And if I distribute a 2, I get 2 times the natural log of 2x minus x plus 10. That's our area function. So if we want to maximize the area of that triangle, I'm going to take the derivative. So now the derivative of 2 times the natural log of 2x will be 2 times 1 over 2x times the derivative of 2x, which is 2. So some chain rule going on there. Minus the derivative of x, which is 1, plus the derivative of 10, which is 0. So let's clean that up a little bit. a prime of x will equal 2 over x minus 1. All right, so where do we go from here? Well, what we've got to do is we've got to set this equal to 0. So I set this equal to zero. 
And in order to solve this, I can give you this a number of ways. Um, you could just do it by guess and check. The only value of x that I see that would make this true would be x equals 2. Algebraically, you could do that by doing the following, getting a common denominator, and then just solving for the numerator. And when I solve for the numerator, that means x, oops, 2 minus x equals 0, which happens when x equals 2. So I know that a prime at 2 is equal to 0. Since there's only one critical value, right, I know that that will either minimize or maximize the area. Okay, so what can I do to confirm that this would be a max? Well, I could find the second derivative. Second derivative would be negative 2 over x squared. And regardless of the x value, I don't care. Uh, this would imply that a prime, excuse me, double prime at 2 would equal negative 2 over 2 squared, which is 4. So you can see that a double prime at 2 will be less than 0. Thus, this will maximize our area function. So somewhere in here, right, uh, right there. How about right here? At 2, whatever this triangle would look like, I'm going to use a color I haven't yet on here. This triangle right here, its area would be the biggest compared to the rest. So it asks for the maximum area, not just what x value maximizes the area. Therefore, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to my area function, this guy right about here, and I'm going to plug in a 2. All right, that 2 comes directly from this 2. So since x equals 2 maximizes the area, I'm going to plug in a 2. So it would be 2 ln of 2 times 2, which is 4, minus 2, plus 10. All right, so a of 2 would equal 2 ln of 4 plus 8. Let's see if that answer is up there. Hey, there it is. We get it. Awesome. So the area is maximized when x equals 2, and its area equals that many units squared. Cool. Uh, I got a little uh, breakdown of how to do these problems on the next slide, so let's look at that. All right, not a whole lot of special anything going on here, just a nice little kind of flow chart of how you should solve these optimization problems. First, read it. I mean, come on now, read it. Draw a picture if you can draw. Identify the constants and label the diagram. That was like, for example, uh, you know, x plus y equals 10, and then we took x times y and called that the product function, right? Label the diagram with variables, those parts that change, right? So certain things change and others didn't. Like with the triangle problem, the base was always 4. But the height was what was changing, right? Find an equation that you want to maximize or, I should say, or minimize. If you have more than two variables, you'll need to find another relationship to get rid of one of them. So we wanted area just in terms of x, or we wanted the product just in terms of x. Right? Usually this is a geometrical relationship like Pythagorean theorem or some kind of triangle relationship or such. Find the domain of the variables. All that the domain does for us is if we do find a critical value, uh, like multiple critical values, one of them might fall outside of that domain. Okay, And if you have a closed interval, then use the extreme value theorem. Right, So you could use what we already know. If not, you'll need to use either the first or second derivative test. You must verify that it is a max or a min value. So either use the second derivative test or the first derivative test to do so. And then, of course, answer the question. All right, hey, that's it. That's uh, whatever this lesson is. I think it's 4.4 .4, uh, on optimization. See you in the next video.